Welcome to Open Source Summit North America 2025 here in Denver, Colorado. My name is Sam Weston with theCUBE Research and I am joined today with theCUBE Research's very own Paul Nashawadi, who is the practice lead for our application development and modernization practice. And we are here to talk all things open source. Welcome, Paul. Hey, great to be here, Sam. It's awesome being here. The show floor is crazy busy. After that keynote, it was awesome. The keynote was great. It there was. was a lot to unpack there, but it before we do, I actually want to take a step back because I think that we need to kind of level set on what we can expect here, why we're seeing what we're seeing. Uh, so jumping back into last week, we had your App Dev Summit. Yeah. And part of that summit was a whole bunch of research that I don't think that we talk about very much. That we had a whole bunch of guests on, we talked about the we talked to the other analysts during the summit, but the underlying data behind that was four studies, 160 questions. So can you tell us a little bit more about the scope, the themes that we were uncovering there? Oh, absolutely. Well, first off, I talk about the data all the time. <laughs> so I talk about this, it's fantastic. But yeah, four studies, 160 questions. We, we go across day zero, day one, day two, build, release, and operations, as well as DevSecOps, anything that touches the CICD pipeline and the overall SDLC. So lots to kind of unpack there. The App Dev Summit was incredibly powerful. And to tie it back into what we're seeing here at the Open Source Summit, there's, you can't have an App Dev Summit without talking about open source. Right. Yeah, and it's, uh, it's relevant right now, right? Open source is having a moment, if you will. Sure is. You know, especially with AI coming up. And one of the things, before we get into just everything open source, I want to actually talk about some of the data points that we found from that study, how those are going to apply, why open source is having such a moment. So you've been doing this for a number of years now. You've been, tr you've been tracking the trending data throughout these summits, throughout your, your research, and there's some challenges that we see that are pretty consistent that organizations are facing. <coughs> but with everything changing now, there's also some new challenges coming out. So if we look at the market, we look at the data points, we look at what's trending, what's new, what are you seeing? Yeah, that's a great question. I think when we talk about the practice overall, we, te we tend to talk about past, present, future. Mm -hmm. We talk about heritage environments, we talk about what that, those environments mean, why that, Im that information is important and critical to driving towards today's current standards. And when we look at today's current standards, it, it takes everything that we've, what we're seeing in the Open Source Summit here, at where everything we're seeing is really being, uh, is taken off, right? We're seeing be, uh, between uh, you know, heritage API calls are being changed over to, uh, you know, whether it's uh, using you know, A2A or MCP, uh, or in, in that announcement alone during the keynote was it was really crazy to see, just to see how it's really expanding out on A2A. Uh, we, we also see that 61% of organizations are actively investing in platforms that are around AI-driven activities. That, is, that in itself is driving towards that, the goal of uh, these new approaches. And also, AI is happening at such a record clip mm -hmm. that the innovation has to keep happening very quickly and organizations are adopting this information uh, rapidly. So, so that's why I think that we're seeing the kind of convergence between the technology and the tech stacks and what we're seeing again here at the Open Source Summit. So you talked previously a lot about your skills gap issues and complexity issues that organizations are facing. Yeah, absolutely. And how is that evolving with the introduction of AI? Because everything's moving so fast, we can't look at modernization being a one-time effort anymore. It has to be a journey, it has to be ongoing. Yeah. When we're seeing the pace of things change, and one of the things they said in the keynote was that uh, LLMs are last year's news. You know, <laughs> how do we feel about that? This yeah. isn't even new anymore. Yeah. Now. Everything's about agentic, and so to be able to keep pace with this, we can't modernize once. It's not, it's not a one-time effort, so how do yeah. we look at that journey now? It's, it's a great question. Um, modernization is a treadmill. It's, uh, it's continuous, it's going to continuously happening, especially with the introduction of AI, right? It's, gonna, it's going to continuously drive forward. The thing that we have to understand is governance, compliance, and regulations need to be kind of put into place. And when we saw in our research and the study in the AppDev Summit, we found that that was a big part in the concern from organizations around uh, how organizations are moving forward with modernization, with heritage applications, and bridging the gap to new. So they're using technologies like uh, agent technologies in order to make the connections to rapidly accelerate application development, right? But this application development acceleration 
potentially is opening up holes that are knocking regulations and compliance. And that's a challenge that organizations are seeing. We're also seeing a skill gap. You mentioned skill gap issues, so I want to come back to that. We see that in our research, 67% of organizations are hiring generalists over specialists. Well, so why is that? It's, it's not because they don't want to hire specialists, it's because that those organizations are having difficulty finding uh, the specialists. But now, with the introduction of some of these AI models that are being put in place, you no longer need to have a specialist in order to innovate, right? A generalist can do the work that historically a specialist had to do. So we're seeing that kind of growth as well. So the agents are now the ones that are bridging that gap, they're fixing that skills gap issue. Yeah, we're seeing that, absolutely. The agents are the ones bridging the gap, but they're also, uh, again, with the introduction of different approaches, potentially opens up security holes. And that's what we have to watch for. Well, and you know me, I love everything compliance and security and regulation. Yep. <laughs> uh, but with the, with the skills gap issue being bridged now, so we've figured out how to fill some of those gaps, it doesn't reduce complexity though. No. Because it's new technologies, we're still, you know, we're, we're having to fill the gaps, we, we're not completely compliant yet, there is new governance, you see CRA coming out soon. How are we dealing with this? How are we dealing with the complexity? Yeah, complexity is a challenge. I mean, this is something that organizations are definitely needing to follow those regulations and rules. We're, uh, it's not anything new. I mean, this is something that regulations and rules have been in place for a long time, right? Mm -hmm. Especially when you start looking at, you know, executive orders that are put in for S bombs, right? That's something that's that's a North America thing. But you're seeing the the EU CRA, which was definitely talked about during the keynote today. That was uh, that was absolutely something. We're also seeing that, you know, uh, our research has shown. 72% of IT decision makers are prioritizing supply chain transparency and their 2025 planning. Right? This is a big part of how you can have the understanding of what's going on with your compliance and regulation without having to break that compliance and right regulations that you might have in place. It's very true, and we also have uh, Open Observability Summit as part of this event, and you know, one of the things that we t talk about quite a bit is that you can't fix something, you can't modernizing something you can't see, you can't secure something that you can't see that you don't understand, so how is all of this tying together as well? Well, we were seeing, it, yeah, Open Observability is, uh, obviously observability is near and dear to my heart, as you know, day two operations is a big part of my practice and what we do here. Uh, you know, we were seeing in our research that there's uh, over uh, six to 15 different tools are being used by for, to manage observability across organizations. This is 75% of respondents indicated that. In 2025 alone, 54% of those same respondents indicated that they want to unify for a, 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 a unified view. So I'm really looking forward to some of the conversations that we have lined up for later today mm -hmm. uh, around observability, around the observability summit that's coming up later this week, and, and also sharing some of those data points that we have coming out of last week's summit. Uh, that was really a, a big factor in the, in the research as well. So talking about observability though, you know, it wasn't that many months ago we were over at KubeCon and the right. number of observability vendors there is just growing like crazy. It is. And now we're talking open observability. So what do you think we're going to see going forward in regard to are we going to go open? Are we going to go, you know, five to six to 15 vendors? You know, what, what are we seeing? Yeah, I think it really, um, when it comes to open observability and it comes to observability in general, maturity within organizations really matter. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, to understand what the organization is doing, um, they, the reason why there's six to, different, six to 15 different tools within uh, these organizations is because observability practices have evolved over time. And you know, they'll start with things like logs and metrics and, and, and alerting, right? And that's where they really start. And I would make a joke of saying that, that you know, observability practices are really uh, storage admins because they store everything and they collect everything and they don't really do anything with the data. And that, unfortunately, that's not helpful, right? So, but now organizations are looking at things like tracing and, and um, APM, application performance management and network performance management, NPM, and understanding what all this means across the environment. So when you start bundling in the melt the metrics around melt and such into what you're trying to achieve, you have to have actionable insights in order to make uh, make your your CI/CD pipeline as well as your DevSecOps teams secure, you know, understand what's happening. So those actionable insights are really coming from that unified view. So back to open source and, and observability, well, my view is 
uh, OTEL and the open source community that's using you know, the different standards like OTEL uh, are really starting to expand and reach out into covering different stacks, a part of the parts of the stack for observability, um, mm -hmm. and that's going to become more and more unified as, as time goes on. The one thing that really stood out to me in that, and I'm sure everybody would agree, is the actionable insights, right? Like that is the goal of observability, is understand what's happening so that we can action it, we can make it better, we can do something with it, right? right? So those actionable insights are now also going to be driving the agentic models. Yeah, I, I think that's accurate. I think what the other thing we find is actionable insights are, are a variation of what, you know, we used to have the red, yellow, green dashboards, right? And the red, yellow, green dashboards would say, where are we in the state of the business, right? Mm -hmm. But that wasn't taking action, that was just saying that there was something wrong or right. Right, now we're saying, well, with uh, new agent models that are being deployed and, and, and put into observability, those actionable insights are now being taken by the agent. Now, I still believe we need a human in the loop at this point, course, right? Yes. For right now, let's make sure things are working and how things work. Now, it won't be long before the human is out of the loop, but for right now, a human in the loop is important, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but in order to, to see a trigger happen, that trigger needs to be taken and something needs to occur after the fact. So I think that's where, where it's going. And give human in the loop, absolutely. We want to keep them involved. We want to make sure that we're moving in the right direction. But the goal isn't to replace the human. It's to open up the human's time to do more, innovate further. So what are we seeing here? You know, open source, that it's it's popping right now. And it's really because of AI, right? Yeah. That it is. Yeah. So we're freeing up developer time. We are. We actually get to innovate now. What are we seeing here? What's going to be coming next? Well, look, I'll tell you this much, Sam. I think that if we look at it from the context of how AI is being used, organizations that are not leveraging AI for innovation are going to fall behind competitively. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's just a fact because things are moving much faster than they ever have moved before. Innovation, unfortunately, what we see in our research is um, only a third of the developer's time is being spent innovating. They're still spending two thirds of their time in maintenance. So what we're seeing is AI and agents being able to take away some of those tedious or tasks that, that really take up that maintenance time. That's where really what we want to get to is, is having AI and automation take over those pieces and let the developer expand into that more innovation. But not only did the professional developer, we're also talking about new breeds of developers that move into the lines of business. So what we're seeing at the, you know, at the summit here today is we're seeing the enablement of the digital ecosystem, right? We're seeing that digital transformation, you know, is the word, I almost say that in a way that I laugh because nobody really says that anymore, but it's true. We're digitally transforming, but it's a accelerating digital monetization and, you know, and modernization, right? So it's taking those approaches and accelerating it using AI to do so. We are a little bit away from like that complete like, oh, the AI is going to take control of it. Again, human in the loop right now. But I think that's the kind of utopian view is trying to get to where you need to go to. And I think that's the perfect segue into another one of the keynote announcements actually is, what did you think about all of the different uh, production that was happening? Fully AI, fully open source, or not fully AI, fully open source with the help of AI, uh, the videos, the movies that were being produced. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting perspective, right? I mean, when we start looking at the media industry to produce and create videos um, mm -hmm. using AI, it's going to do a couple of different things. It's going to uh, expand into areas that um, you know, we, we weren't able to do before. Take a look at different formats. For example, when you're filming things in a, uh, like a 4-3 format or even a landscape format, um, that is not being used across like things like uh, these big spheres, like the sphere in Las Vegas, for example. And that's just coming live in August, right? Where they took, you know, a, a video that was filmed on a 4-3 format and now it's being viewed on the sphere. That's amazing to me. That is really, really cool stuff. Um, and I think that video edit and using AI to expand is only going to get better and better as we see these things moving forward. And so it's not AI taking the job, it's AI making an enabler so that better. everybody has a better experience. Yeah, that's exactly right. And using different ways of delivery. Yeah. All right, well, I think that we're coming up on time here, but before we wrap up, what else are you most excited for the rest of this week? 
Oh, I, I mean, I think the announcement around Open Infra Foundation joining the Linux Foundation was, was, was a big key area. I think that you know, AI modeling, sign, uh, signing, release, that was another area I thought was interesting. I was uh, intrigued by NVIDIA shipping you know, one billion RISC V cores. That was kind of cool. That's in, incredible. Yeah, in the announcement. I thought that was really cool. And then, of course, the, uh, the, the CNCF having the, uh, the research uh, that impacts AI. I'm really looking to get my hands on that and dive into that. Those areas that came out of the keynote were really kind of the things that popped in my mind. I did push that out on social uh, earlier today, but I also think that those are areas I want to double click down on. But I also want to walk the floor here. The, the amount of excitement you're seeing here is really just popping, right? There's a lot of interest around how to do things, but both from the early stage uh, organizations that are trying to get to like where they want to go, and also very, very mature organizations that are knowing how to use the technology and how to use it moving forward. So, looking forward to those conversations in, in, over the next couple of days. I, I completely agree. The economic value that we heard, you know, that report that was coming out from the, the, uh, the foundation today, definitely want to check out. So, understanding why open source is so important, and I'm sure that's what we're going to hear all throughout the rest of this conference, but I'm actually going to leave you here for the rest of the conference to talk to all of our guests. But I want to thank you all for joining us so far today. We are live on YouTube and thecube.net and stay tuned for more insights throughout the show.